<laughs> Viva La Vegan! Hi, I'm Lee Chantel from VivaLaVegan.net and today my guest is Colleen Patrick Goodrow from Oakland in California in the United States of America. She's an author, speaker and a joyful vegan. You can see her at her website, also joyfulvegan.com. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you. First of all, I had no idea you sang that live. Oh, didn't you? <laughs> So, second of all, do people in Australia know where Oakland, California is? Probably not, but a lot of a, most of my fan base is from um, California, so they'll know where it is. <laughs> hope, ho hopefully, if they do, they don't come here, but they're they're missing out. Because so. <laughs> you do a lot of activism around your area too. I do, I do. I am involved in a lot, and it's uh, it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense, but um, it's where I live, and it's where I love living. So I try to be active in you know my local community. Yeah, which everyone should be, really, shouldn't they? So, and what so so people that don't know about Oakland in particular, Australians, what what's it like? What's the place good known for? Um, you know, Oakland has such. A misconception surrounding it because I think what hits the news a lot is because it's a big city with an urban, you know, an urban, a huge urban area, and because it has suffered from all there's poverty and, and thus there's crime, and so people think that we just like walk down the street and get shot at. Mm -hmm. So, um, and really what Oakland is is many things, and the thing that I love so much about it is the, the, the beauty. We have such a huge park system here. I can walk to hiking trails from my house. The weather is absolutely perfect. It's mm, not cold perfect. and foggy and windy like San Francisco. <laughs> and um, the, really, it's just, and it's not as hot as when, once you cross over on the mountains on, to the east of us. Um, it's the most diverse city. I think it's, I honestly, I'm not just saying this, it's the most diverse city in the country. Good, so good, it's good. just, you know, it's just filled with just a variety of wonderful people, and that means wonderful cuisines and culture and music and art and so it's many things and we absolutely love it. That's great. That's I, like you were saying about the guns over here and I guess a lot of other countries that haven't been to America before. When I first went to America, um, people were going, make sure you watch out for people with guns. They've all got guns. They're all gun crazy. So um, everyone has all different misconceptions of things, don't they? <laughs> I know it's true, and that's a whole other conversation because we because it is crazy. It's we we don't like it. We don't like that 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 there's so much gun violence in this country, and it is true compared to other countries, a lot of other countries. So that's a different interview. Yeah, <laughs> and you, I've seen some photos of you, like just out your. I don't know if it's your backyard, but somewhere close to your. Um, area that you've got little foxes and animals, like deer, even like that's gorgeous. It is. It's our it's our yard. I mean, we live up on a hillside, so we're just really lucky to have all of the um, borrowed views of all of the surrounding neighbors, and it's just very green and very wooded. So we, yeah, foxes and deer and skunks and raccoons and squirrels mm -hmm. and lots of birds. It's pretty. It's magical. That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Yeah. And so Colleen is the author of various books, including The Joy of Vegan Baking. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Color Me Vegan. And she also has a re-release of her book called 30 Day Vegan Challenge. Can you tell us why did you get into writing in the first place? Uh, well, my background and my first passion has always been writing. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote, gosh, I had a little pen name when I was in high school because I dreamed of being a writer. I just loved writing and expressing myself in that medium. So uh, I went to school formally. You know, my, my academic background is in writing and language and literature. And so it was just a natural progression and expression of what I think and believe and because the other passion in my life or another passion in my life is uh, animal advocacy and veganism it just made sense that writing would be um, writing about all of this um, would be would be what I what I do mm -hmm. Good. and so tell me about the 30 day vegan challenge the book because you did have it released at the first Vita vegan con in Portland I remember as a speaker I got one of your books in the yeah. in the gift bag and um, now you're about to re-release it. Can you tell us about why you need to re-release it, the process of creating it? 
Yeah, uh, so yeah, it came out originally in 2011, and for various reasons, it went out of print, um, out of my control, mm -hmm. and um, it was um, a book that sold almost 20,000 copies in the first two months it was out, it's so amazing. clearly, it's it was, yeah, it was striking a nerve, and I, I knew it would, because I because I think the concept is, uh, it's, it's not original, it's, I think it's a brilliant concept, and I'm not taking credit for that. The, the idea of saying to folks, look, just let me give you what you need. Just do it for 30 days to at least stop something long enough to recognize your habits. And in that time, I'll give you everything you need to change those habits and to create a foundation so that when the 30 days is over, you can stand confidently and firmly uh, and helpfully in that new in that new habit, in those new habits. So that's what spawned the 30 Day Vegan Challenge. And when it went out of print, um, you know, I just knew I wanted to get it back out there. So I built the 30 day vegan challenge online program. So that exists and that will stay in existence. And that's videos and audio messages and recipes and resources for me online. It's all multimedia. And I knew that I wanted the book to get back out there again, being a writer, yeah. <laughs> obviously. So, uh, and a reader. So I launched a uh, crowdfunding campaign to get the book back out, and we funded it. And so I'm actually, by next week, by the time this airs, or by the time it airs, it will be at the printer, and it will uh, be coming out in January 2015, but hopefully by Christmas 2014. So I'm really grateful. And the process of creating the book, it's very different than just writing a book. I, you know, I've art directed the book, and I was the editorial you know, director for the book and just a lot more roles than I would normally play as just mm -hmm. the writer of the book. So it's been pretty intense, but incredibly gratifying. And I've had the most amazing people work on it with me. So I'm really excited to share it with the world. It's more beautiful. It's so beautiful. And it's, it blows away the original edition. So in talking about that, what's different from the original version to now? So in terms of content, what's different is the recipes. The recipes are all completely new. So okay, brand wow. recipes that don't exist anywhere else. Um, and then, you know, some content's updated and, uh, you know, just freshened up. But the gist is the same in terms of the bulk of the content. But the whole design is different. Photographs are different. It's really, you know, my love letter to veganism. It's really, this is what it looks like to live joyfully and and compassionately and so it's really an expression of what that looks like to me that's great yeah. I love the cover too it's a beautiful cover thank you <laughs> and talking about um, you being a joyful vegan and being able to promote yourself across many social media platforms you're on like all the social media Facebook Twitter Instagram Pinterest YouTube and your podcasts are on iTunes, um, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. So do you have a favorite um, medium for social media? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I don't. I guess I wouldn't in the past have looked at you know, YouTube and the podcast as social media, but it really is now. I mean, because it's, because it's so much about engagement and mm. providing yeah. value to the listener base or the viewership that I can – connect with directly. So, so I, you know, I love the medium of audio. I love radio. I just love that medium. So I love doing the podcast. Um, I love doing videos too. Videos are just a little more labor intensive and I'm working to change that so that I can do more videos. Um, and then as far as the, all the other social media platforms, it's really a matter of they're all so different. And I think that's, what's interesting about the time we're in is that we've kind of settled into really understanding the difference between Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram and all of the different mediums and they're all so different so I have really enjoyed recently really increasing my participation in Instagram because I take so many photographs mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily take you know the food porn but I take uh, I don't know animal porn sounds really bad so I don't want to use that analogy <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's not cut a whole uh, different subject <laughs> yeah that's a whole different thing but but taking these uh, photographs of all of the animals and just wildlife and nature that surrounds me including my cats so I'm very lucky to have people who want to indulge me and <laughs> 
um, look at my cats <laughs> because I want to look at my cats all the time and apparently <laughs> other people do as well. So Instagram's been really fun getting into that medium because I love, I love photography and I love visual arts. And Facebook, I think, is really where most of my engagement happens, but it's happening over at Instagram too. Twitter, I'm still trying to figure out. Twitter's a little bit of a a little bit of a mystery to me yet. So I, I'm still trying to find my voice over there and what works best for the people following me there. I love Twitter. Like I've found, especially for some, like I'm doing this athletes interviews book and I found so many people just from asking people on Twitter with hashtags if they wanted to be involved. Like if you're really into the hashtags and get involved with that, you can really get to quite a different audience or different people than you would have normally. And I love Google Plus just because I have like such high engagement on Google Plus. And fa Facebook to me, I'm just, I'm really bored with Facebook at the moment. So it's a really quite a challenge a lot of the time to get involved with Facebook. <laughs> It's interesting. It's it's different. It's different for everybody, and yeah. it, and it may and probably will change for me in a year. It probably won't be Facebook. I don't know what it will be. I'm I'm really liking G plus and looking forward to getting back in into it as well. So and then realistically, I mean, you can only spend because I really do want to engage and give people value for what they're you know they're following me. Um, it's hard to do more than three or four to really provide that value. That's right. That's, That's right. Different. And so talking about podcasts, um, how long have you been doing your podcast for? Uh, uh, eight or nine years now. That's a long time. Yeah. Mm. And so can you tell us about the process of creating your podcast? Of initially creating it or just when I create different episodes? Um, well, yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you create it originally? <laughs> Well, originally it was fun because I had just finished, I had produced a DVD, a cooking DVD. So this goes back about 10 years now. And uh, and when I was done with it, and this is before YouTube, and this is before all the social engagement online. And so after I was done with it and it was out there and people were really loving it, my question to myself, and things were starting to happen online, but not a ton, I was asking myself and some colleagues, should I do another DVD? Hmm. And at that time, you know, you physically print the DVD. I mean, it was labor intensive and expensive Expensive. and yeah, and you've got to create, you know, got all this stuff and packaging and all of that. So, um, some, so one of my colleagues I had worked with on the DVD said, uh, you should start podcasting. And I said, yeah, that's a great, that's a really great idea. I could do that. What's a podcast? Because I really didn't understand what a podcast was at it the was time. It was new then, probably. It was really new. Yeah. And I, I got it. Like, I understood that it was an audio medium, but I didn't know more than that. So I was like, oh, that's a, okay. And my husband, being a musician, just, you know, on, on the side, uh, he had a microphone. He had a soundboard. And, you know, he had everything. And I just, I wrote it first because I really do, I write every single episode before I record and I wrote out the first episode was the protein myth. And I wrote it and I recorded it and I put it out there. And then people found it and started listening. And that was the beginning of, of Food for Thought. And so, so it stayed that way for many years. And it still is that way today in terms of researching and writing it out before I do it. I, I really put a lot of thought and time and research in, into each episode. But what's been exciting is it's definitely evolved. And what's exciting now is incorporating phone calls. And so being able to take people's phone calls so they can ask me directly what their questions are, challenges, or concerns, and then incorporating those into the podcast. It's been really, it's been really enriching for me and I think for the listeners as well. So it was nice to kind of change it up and and, threat. and and everyone, you know, you know, so everyone's loved it. I mean, nobody's complained. Uh, it, the only thing some people, the feedback I got was I stopped doing as many of the love letters in the beginning because I get these amazing love letters from people, mm -hmm. and I didn't do as many in the beginning. And people were like, "I missed the love letters," and I was afraid people were going to be, you know, like, "All right, get to the get to the meat of the podcast." I said meat. I did. Yeah. I said meat. <laughs> Talk about that another time. Um, but I was afraid people were like, "Get to the topic," yeah. but no. A lot of people, I mean, I can't speak for every listener, but a lot of people really loved, love hearing other people's stories. So that's back into the beginning of the And, of and the positive things. People just love hearing positive stuff. 
Absolutely. And they can identify so much too. And I think being able to hear yourself and other people's stories, I think is really helpful for people. And so the process in creating your um, podcast, you said you've got like the mic and you've got the sound um, desk or the mixing desk. Um, what do you, other, what other things have you got? The mic right here. This is your mic? Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's that? Do you know what brand that is? It's a Samson. I've had it. I started with this mic, and uh, can I come all the way? Yes. I started with this mic, and I, I. This is the mic I've had for eight years. Wow. It has wow. failed me yet. Um, I don't use the soundboard anymore, so I use the mic, and I just use GarageBand. That's the. That's pretty much. Uh, and then I've got yeah, I've got some other doohickeys, but um, but pretty much that's it. And now I'm also doing a little bit more kind of more mobile, not mobile, but I'm working with lots of other doohickeys in terms of being able to do podcasting outside of just my desk. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm working with those things, but pretty much my mic and, and garage band. And do you edit a lot when you're in garage band? Um, one thing that has come over the last several years is that I'm so grateful because, especially because of the, the, the listener support that I get, I'm able to, I, I have an engineer now who does the editing because it was so painful. I, you know, I put so much into the writing and so much into the research and then I would record it and then to have to edit it and listen to myself. It's just the last thing I want to do is sit and listen to myself and edit myself for a few hours. Like I just want to get it out. And so I've got an amazing engineer. He's vegan and he's so fantastic. So I just send the file to him. He edits it. He splices in the calls. He splices in the intro and the outro. And, um, and it's made it a lot, a lot easier for me. Definitely. It would have. And um, you're on um, libsing.com with your podcast. Is that where is that where you host your podcast? That's where I host it. And so, do you just have to upload the file to there? Is that all? Yeah, and then there's the description, which is also the part mm -hmm. that's just you know. It's so I just want to get it out tedious. there. <laughs> show notes and like all of that it's just yeah it's tedious it's exactly I just want to I just want to release it so um but that's what it, that's what I use right now I use lips and I've used that for for quite a long time I guess I was using feed burner and that became a nightmare when mm. Yahoo bought it it was just a nightmare so it's uh it's at Libsyn now and now but now we're using SoundCloud to get all the episodes up there as well not as a feed because I don't think they have a podcast feed yet well, but, we were talking about that last time, yeah. and I'm sure there is an RSS feed. Yeah. I think you have to go through, like, it's not an easy way to find it, but, yeah, I'll send you something. I remember just recently I saw something about it. So if and if if it's not, like, live for everyone now, I think it's something they're trying to bring in. Okay, thanks. So that yeah. would be really good, I think. Like, I'd prefer to use SoundCloud as the RSS feed for my podcast than other places I use. Did you, um, so you haven't, you haven't, see, I'm just afraid of the, the, the transition. We can yeah. talk about that. Later. Okay. <laughs> well, I've yeah. got, like, I use SoundCloud for my music, but I've, I'm also in the process of setting up one for Viva La Vegan with all my previous, like, video, I'm getting all my videos and converting them to audio and then just putting all of them on SoundCloud. So there's, like, you know, 200 or something. So it's a bit of a long process. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Even putting all of the audio files up, I've, I've luckily had someone, a volunteer, has actually been helping me with that. Cool. Um, so cool. we have every 160 podcast episodes up on uh, SoundCloud now. And if people don't know, it's just fabulous because it's just so easy to listen to and so easy to comment. You can pause in the middle of a sound file and comment right on that moment on in that, the. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it's so brilliant and easy to share and really connected to social media. So I love SoundCloud. Definitely. Definitely. And um, so you were talking a bit about the 30-Day Vegan Challenge program before. Why did you decide that people would want to have like an interactive sort of program? I just really obviously work in all different mediums and I think everyone responds to different mediums. You know, I respond to all of them, even though I'm a writer and a reader, I'm also a viewer and a listener. So I think it just comes from my own desire to consume information in different forms and it depends on the time of the day or where you are or what mood you're in. So I just always had the idea. In fact, I should actually back up. My original idea 
several years ago was to do the online program first. I always envisioned it as an online program. So that's the truth of the matter. And then when I was pitching uh, books to my agent at the time, uh, and I pitched her the 30-Day Vegan Challenge, really not not anticipating writing it as a book, she said that, we, that's, yeah, we need to do that book. And I was like, yeah, that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. So once the book came out, then I started working on the online program. And then when it went out of print, at least I had the online program because mm-hmm. I wanted that information to get out there. And now with the book coming out again, they'll complement each other. Yeah, that's good. And do you have an e-book that goes along with that as well? Just... Yeah, well, when the, new, when the new book comes out, there'll be an e-book. But yeah. with the program, did you have an e-book with it or...? No, no, it's, um, the, the information is conveyed through audio messages Mm -hmm. from me, videos from me, and some printable Mm -hmm. material from me, including printable resources and recipes. So it was always meant to be consumed in these different mediums. It wasn't meant to be read as one thing. And more like one day you've got this to download instead of just, oh, here's this massive download, read it whenever type thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what sort of um, people join the the challenge? Are they vegans before, or it's a variety, and I I really love that. You know, I mean, the concept of the thirty day vegan challenge, just in general, is I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm not saying go vegan. I'm not saying it's just it, for whatever reason. If you're interested in trying this or learning some new information, here it is, and that's really the concept. And so people, and I, and the thirty days make people feel a little safer because mm-hmm. they're not making a promise, and so they it it feels a lot more. Uh, they just they feel like they're able to do it because yeah. I could do it for 30 days sure and then of course the idea is by the end of the 30 days so much has shifted for them that they do it does become permanent so that's what I find for the most part so these you know these are folks who you know have health issues and they want it they heard that a vegan diet could change and help them they saw something about animals and they don't want to contribute to that anymore and they, they in their heart they want to be vegan but they don't know how I mean that's really the whole concept the concept is people already know why that's already out there it's not a mystery there are so many reasons and we already know that this is a solution so my focus in the 30 day vegan challenge isn't even to say why that information is out there in a thousand other mediums and books this is I know you want to do it for whatever reason you do and I'm not even going to question it. it doesn't matter to me but I know people struggle with the how so here's how here's everything you need to do this confidently like I said and, and, and joyfully and healthfully and you know and, and deliciously and giving them all of the tools they need to, to do it definitely um, so why did you go vegan in the beginning I'm not vegan oh you're not really <laughs> you're one of those <laughs> I've heard about those. <laughs> oh gosh, that clip's gonna that clip's gonna like just get <laughs> go viral. It'll be a gif everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not vegan. I'm not vegan. I'm not vegan. Um, I just thought it'd be fun to answer that question differently. So if I <laughs> have a different answer, kind of change it up a little bit. Because you're bored some- with your answer that you've been giving for yeah, 18 or- years or whatever. <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna make something up. Uh, um, <laughs> So I was working in a slaughterhouse. I don't know. So, um, well, no, I mean, I think that's what, you know, my story isn't anything extraordinary. And I think that's maybe what makes me accessible for people because my story is like so many other people's story. You know, being raised in an American home, eating a lot of meat and dairy and and eggs and, you know, living in the house that even today my, my parents would say, we didn't really eat a lot of meat. Yes, you, we did. <laughs> We ate, you know, meat, dairy, and or eggs every meal. Like, there wasn't a meal where we didn't have that, right? And that was in the 70s, you know, growing up. And, and, and it's even worse today. I mean, I think people are even eating more than they did when I was growing up. So I was that person, but I, but I also was the person who, who loved animals. I was always an animal lover, always, 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 always. And always helped when they were suffering. I mean, I'm very, you know, empathic. I, I really suffer if I see anyone suffering and even people. I mean, I just cry if someone's crying and I just can't help it. So I was that kid and I don't think my parents really knew what to do with me because <laughs> they weren't like me. They weren't emotional like that. And, and so, yeah, so, you know, just kind of the typical stuff. And, you know, it became, I became conditioned to eat animals and, my father owned ice cream stores, was eating, you know, lots of lots of ice cream and, and dairy. We had hot chocolate machines at home and 
you know, tubs of ice cream and that's the way I grew up. Mm. And I didn't know, I didn't make the connection. And so fast forward to when I was 19 or 20 and I read Diet Food New America and was already again inclined toward animals and was always inclined toward new information too. Mm. Okay. Um, at one point, was it, yeah, I guess it was after that when I was working in a health food store, like I was always inclined toward information. Mm. So I read the book, missed the boat on the dairy and the eggs, but I stopped eating land animals, you know, just immediately and really became an animal advocate in in many other ways, like so many of us who when we first find out about animal issues, you just like take it all in and read everything you can about every issue. And so I was reading about animal testing and you know, puppy mills and circuses and zoos and I was just all over the place, but what but what I but I'd stopped eating animals. And so I would have called myself an animal advocate, but I didn't call myself vegetarian because I was eating aquatic animals. Mm -hmm. And Uh then several years later, after reading uh, Slaughterhouse, which was devastating and life-changing, and I'm so grateful for it, um, it was it. Like, vegan overnight. And I'm so interested in this, um, Lee, I'm sure you understand this. Like, I'm so fascinated by this I became vegan. Like, what does that mean? Like, you you morphed like into some right new being. Like, what does that mean? Hmm. And um, I'm really interested in that because we all have the same experience, but the language we have for it is I became vegan. Hmm. And so for me, when I reflect on that, really I became awakened to the compassion that was already inside of me that had been covered up by all of the conditioning. And so it really was quite literally. Uh, an awakening, and um, and I I I saw it all for what it was, and I couldn't have anything to do with it. And it was just that effortless. It was that easy in the sense of there wasn't even a question. There wasn't a question. I figured I figured everything out that I needed to figure out. Went home to my husband, said, "I am vegan now. Like I I can't do this anymore." And um, and that was the beginning of of. Of, of my activism bumping up to the point where it became my living. I think there's just a point where you, I don't know, you're ready for it or you're open to something. Like what you were saying, you always wanted to learn things. Some mm. people are quite content never to go outside of their little square or their little wherever they live in the suburbs or their friend circle or the things that they do like that's you know they could do that for the rest of their life and they'd be fine but there's so many people like you like myself like you know the p- people I spend most of my time with that are just craving something else or craving new stuff and I think with veganism I, n- I didn't even know about it like when I, I remember at school in home economics there was like, we were talking about vegetarianism and there was like maybe a, a line about, oh, a vegan someone who doesn't eat any animals or animal products. It's very strict and very hard diet and you'll have all these deficiencies. That's all I knew about it. So, it, and I think that's, I, don't, I hope it's still not taught in schools <laughs> anymore, but um, like a lot of those things keep getting repeated, don't they, over and over. Yeah. And, um, they just get ingrained, yeah. culturally ingrained. Exactly. And um, you were talking about when you came home and told your husband that you, you were vegan now. I love hearing the story about um, your husband's transition to veganism. Could you please share that with us? Do you? Yeah, I love it. Just, you know, I, well, I, like, I like love stories for one. And then I also like um, stories about, you know, people that, there's so much drama about oh my boyfriend's not vegan or I'm not going to date someone because they're not vegan and stuff like that and I just like because you're quite open and I just love the story both being open and you just both you know go on the same path (laughs) yeah 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 actually I was just interviewed um from by someone who's doing uh I got distracted my cat's right here who's who's doing um, need to call can you have a girl um, who's doing a book on, on vegan dating and relationships. And so she just interviewed me, but so it was just, it's fun reflecting on that time. And, you know, cause it was 16 years ago now and it's just, I, well, 15 years, 15 years ago going on 16. And so, um, 
Yeah, and and that's what I say. You know, I, I I'm not in love with David because he's vegan. I'm in love with him because he's open and compassionate and kind and good. And so I was out of town. I was in LA actually um, at some conference, some tech conference at the time for the company I was working for, and I was reading Slaughterhouse at the time. <laughs> and I was in my room and just weeping and sobbing, and it was just so painful. And you know everything else around me was meaningless. I mean, it was already, I didn't want to be there, but, but it was even more meaningless. And so I remember, I remember sitting on the bed calling David and saying, you know, sobbing and saying, I'm, I'm vegan. I can't do this. I just can't do this. And, and he was so of course sympathetic and I got home and I said, he can't even be in the house. Like I can't look, I can't, it's just such a, it's not even a symbol. It is, it is the manifestation of so much suffering and violence and so he was like, okay, like not an issue. Just, yeah. Okay. You know, if your happiness, you know, your happiness means more than me having shrimp in the refrigerator. Right. I mean, that was his immediate response. And we, you know, time goes on and memories, you know, we, we, cha we, we create stories. We can't remember if it's six months or a year, but at some point he read the books that I had recommended and, um, and, and it, for him just made sense as well. We, you know, David and I talk a lot. I mean, I process a lot. I talk, I talk a lot. I talk more than David does. He has to listen a lot. And <laughs> we do talk a lot. And so we would talk about, you know, just the, the illogic and, and that it's not about logic. It's about, you know, our hearts. And, but we would talk, you know, kind of about like, why, why do we, why do we eat fish, but not sh like, large fish like why do we eat small fish but not large fish like I would never eat shark like when I was eating aquatic animals right why was that okay to, like why was it okay to eat salmon but I was and so we would process it together and you know we both came to the same conclusion I just came to it you know earlier and then guided him through the the books that had already been written and he became vegan and it was it's it's been so lovely of course having him on this journey with me it didn't become his journey in terms of the passion that it is for me, but certainly in terms of living in this world together and standing together as this, you know, compassionate couple, it's really a beautiful thing. And he's, he's, I'm incredibly lucky and, and very grateful. Yeah. That's a lovely story. Thank you. <laughs> and so you, your website is joyfulvegan.com. You call yourself a joyful vegan. Why do you think it is necessary to be joyful? Mm. You know, I, I don't work at it. So some of this is my own personality. I just always have found the beauty and, and, and positive side of things. I am, I was born an optimist. I just was. Having said that, I do believe that we become and create what we focus on. And so I choose to focus on the hope that I have in this world doesn't mean it doesn't bring me down. It doesn't mean I don't cry. I mean, I, I cry looking at the deer outside my window because I know they're struggling with all of the habitat loss they have and the food they're trying to find and the neighbors who, you know, spray their bushes so the deer don't eat it. I mean, just this crazy world we live in is like, I love living around nature, but don't eat my azaleas. And it's like, well, you can't have both. And so my heart breaks when I think of the struggles of, of all the animals around the world. So it's not to say that my heart doesn't break, but, um, but I also believe that at our core we're good people and we want to do the right thing. And so I choose to dwell on that part of humanity and the good that we do and the good that we're capable of. And, and I think, so from an advocacy, so that's just natural for me, that's very authentic for me, but from an advocacy perspective, I think that is what's attractive to people. And I don't mean attractive in a shallow sense, I mean that's what quite literally attracts people to something is passion. Mm. You know, it's this isn't this isn't just joy and Pollyanna and everything's fine and it's all good. It's not that. I mean there's a there's a there's a you know, there's a crusade behind my my work. But um but it's done in a way that I think is appealing for people because this is what you know, this is what it looks like. You know, vegan looks like many things, but this is one of them. And if you like what you see, then you know, you can live consciously and you can live joyfully at the same time. 
Definitely. And from, right. Just from a marketing perspective, it's better if you promote something that's positive rather than a negative. So it's just an easy thing, really. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So um, if people want to find anything more about Colleen, either her books, follow her on social media, you can check her website, joyfulvegan.com, and she's on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube, and her podcast you can find on iTunes, um, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today, Colleen. Thank you. You're so adorable. Thank you. <laughs> I do my best. Thank you. <laughs> and you can see more interviews with inspiring vegans on vivalavegan.net. Thank you and see you next time.